I'd like to call this meeting to order verify compliance with open meetings law notifications and adopt the agenda. Uh, if you can stand with me, we'll do the Pledge of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, first up on our agenda is the uh, Whitnall High School Student Senate Report. Go ahead. Is the green light on on that? Good to go. Okay. Hello. I don't know. Go ahead. All right. Uh, good evening. As many of you may remember, my name is Ryan Teeley, and I'm the Vice President of Student Council. And today I'm joined by Cassie Kopcha, who is a junior class representative. To begin, Student Council starting the new year with a host of different top uh, projects. <coughs> Upon the advice of our advisors, we have formed three micro committees to handle three large projects for the remainder of this year a state committee, a hair donation committee, and a Mr. Falcon committee. Student Council is also starting the new year with our annual winter formal, which is always a major fundraiser for us. The Mr. Falcon committee is dedicated to planning a with no gifts back in the spring with special events every day. We tried a spirit week in the spring for the first time last school year, and while successful, we want to give this year as a purpose. The week will culminate with a Mr. Falcon pageant to raise money for the Sojourner Family Peace House an organization that supports women and children who are the victims of domestic abuse. Mr. Smith from the Science Department gave us the idea as he participated in a pageant when he was a senior in high school and again in college. Through research, we have found that many schools across the country, including the Pier in Green Bay and Aldi Stevenson in Chicago, hold events like this that draw large attendances. The committee will work with other high school clubs and the Hair Donation Committee to put on this great event. The Hair Donation Committee is a simple committee based around creating an event where students have the ability to cut their hair and donate it to charity. We've been working with Mrs. Honaki from the math department to organize this event and have identified a charity, Children with Hair Loss, as the organization we will be working with. We hope this Whitnell Gives Back Week becomes a yearly tradition and incorporates some other fun activities, including a staff student basketball game. I'm going to hand it over to Cassie to talk about the state committee, which she is a member of in our upcoming so coming in early February is the annual winter formal. The theme will be decided at tomorrow's student council meeting during zero hour. Themes such as snow globe and northern lights are the most popular so far. And as Ryan mentioned, student council has a large number of small committees, one of them being the state committee. <coughs> in the spring, student council would like to compete at state to be the best student council. Student councils are evaluated by the state organization on involvement in both school and community through presentations by our students and evaluations by the administration. Our committee makes sure that we are competing in as many competitions as possible to maximize our points, as well as preparing members for their respective competitions. Our council and school also benefit through the many breakout sessions held by state council organization and leadership and involvement in the school. Uh, we would like to thank each and every one of you for allowing us to give you guys another report. And uh, <coughs> do any of you have any questions or comments for us? No, thank you. Wait, I oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> no, so tell me. So I've also uh, had a, a, a Mr. Falcon type of contest. So can you tell me what? So those are all students that will participate in that? <coughs> top vote getters, is there a minimum number of that or just a little bit more on that? Um, to be honest with you, neither of us are on that committee, so Got I can't it. tell you the specifics. But I can tell you that uh, senior males okay. uh, would be. Uh, can be competing and seeing who has, you know, kind of like the coolest uh, talent, talent and, oh. and, and things like that. Um, <coughs> and then, uh, like each vote, you'd like pay to have a vote, and then the vote would count towards who wins, and the money would go to that person, or this charity. That's it. what we're kind of thinking, but it's going to be in the spring, so we still have a long time. Okay. okay, I'll look forward to more details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, thank you guys thank very much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is item four, discussion. Uh, A is referendum planning, the marketing report. Yeah, 
putting together for our marketing and communication plan um, that you'll see up here. So the, the logo that you see there is sort of what we will be using. It's sort of going to play out from the W if you see that in the word um, under the vote with the check mark thing. So we worked with Gray Architects. They have a marketing person in trying to design uh, a unique logo that was here. We wanted to be very careful that the Falcon wasn't overused in too many things because a lot of our, our website and everything have the Falcon. And so we want to make sure that when people saw this, that they identified with the referendum voting and not just the Falcon that we use across the board for all of our schools. So we didn't want to overuse the Falcon a little bit too much. We also have a tag line <coughs> under, underneath that that says referendum, but um, you'll, you'll see where we use this lately. So we have two versions of this, one with this and one that's got referendum um, facilities down below it. So, um, you can scroll down. so we've been meeting with Gray Architects this last week, and we put together, there's two things. Right, right here is what's called sort of our passive pieces of communication. And so a timeline that you see between now and when a vote will take uh, place on April 3rd. And so sort of uh, we, we met with them in terms of what materials would be creative, and it's called passive because we sort of have them ready to go, and we said, hey, here's an idea for a poster. So this is the materials piece of it. <coughs> the passive part of it we met, and we're still developing, because we just met last Thursday late, so we, st we don't have the, the timeline yet, but we put together what would be called active, some ideas for active things. Those are presentations, whether it's through PTOs or the chamber, or where we would actually go out and do active presentations and seek that out, coffee chats with the superintendent, however that is. So there are two parts to it, passive and active. This is the part where we say, hey, we have this flyer, we can put this out there, we have a concert coming up. So this is sort of some of the, <coughs> and it was sort of um, standard, if you would, um, in terms of what they develop. So depending upon if the district has a communications coordinator or not, it really determines where their level of involvement is. So when we met with them and talked about what their role would be in terms of um, strategy, in terms of de the graphic design piece of it, and in terms of having public appearance, um, and where our district team would fit in those places in terms of where we needed their strengths the most. And so we, we decided in each of those elements um, where they would participate. So we're getting a final document, but wanted to share with you some of the draft pieces. So one of the things that came out of it, and if you remember at our last board meeting, and I've received um, some emails from the referendum group email that I have, some people who have some ideas of how to communicate it. So what we didn't want to do is we like, there are some people who have some good ideas in terms of even our communication plan not just informing some other type of group, but helping us decide what messages are most relevant in our community. Because every community is different, depending upon if you have a local newspaper, if you don't have a newspaper, what percentage of your um, community is uh, tuned into social media versus you know how many different um, venues do you have that you can go and talk to people, how active is your chamber, all of those types of things. So um, we were thinking that it would be very um, helpful in beneficial if people who have ideas on helping us develop the communication plan rather than just helping us promote it at the end we got those up front so I think Kathy on the next on the next screen I'm um, going on to the next one I'll come back to that one uh, sorry one more so next Monday a week from tonight um, we and we went in, this went out on social media it went out to the email group um, a week from tonight at 6.30 in here, we want anybody who has ideas to share with us, like, hey, did you know the Lions meet on this date? Or, hey, this is a really good way. Or, hey, my my grandma would do it. You know, this is how she would like to know. Or, this is effective. Or, don't waste your time <coughs> or money on that. We know that every ad we put in a paper newspaper costs money. Is that even worth the money? Or, like, yep, everybody reads the buyer's guide, so you <coughs> should do it there or whatever. So we want to get people's um, ideas on, on, on our communication plan before we set forth exactly what it looks like. We think there's a lot of good ideas out there in terms of where do we best put our money, where do we best put our time and effort um, for the limited resources that we have so we can really get the information out there. So a week from tonight, um, we're going to hold an event here to help people fine tune that. And then you'll see a final communication and marketing plan. So we're in the stages of still developing it and trying to <coughs> solicit, as we have been throughout the process, more stakeholder input. Can't even go back two screens. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So one of the things to be um, that has changed since the last referendum is absentee voting. Um, you can you can be t you can um, register to vote if you're not registered to vote online. Really, <coughs> as long as you're through the DMV, have a license, and all of that. So we need to because, as you recall, um, our voting date is during our spring break week here. Not all families go, but that still means that some families might. So we have to really communicate about what does it mean to absentee vote. What does that look like? What is the timeline? What do our three municipalities in those voting places, if you do, you don't mail it in, 
and you want to do in person, what does that mean? So we're going to spend a lot of time on the whole um, and refer them to the MyVote Wisconsin website because it talks about that. We can just make sure that people are actually registered to vote first of all because if you wait too long for that, you can register in person that day, but you can't do absentee voting if you're not registered. So part of it is just the whole voting process and understanding it because it has changed since the last time the district has gone to referendum in 2015. Um, you can go to the next page, Kathy. So this is the inside pages of the Whitnow window. It just got mailed today, so you should see it in your house in the next day or two. It got mailed up from the printer. And two of the eight pages there, these are, um, I don't think they're pages four and five. So on the left side page, you will see our logo, so people can start to see that, and the actual question that the board voted on in December, so people can actually see the verbiage of the question. On the right side of it, you can sort of see a synopsis of our history. We've done a quick bulleted list of each of the four buildings, so people in a real, in a quick nutshell can see the projects that are being worked on um, at each building. And again, we refer them to our webpage, um, which right now we're sort of changing over from the journey that we've been on, now that the board passed a resolution, to having, as we start to upload video of the, and all of that stuff, so it will, you will start to see that transition into, here's what it looks like for referendum versus here's our journey we're on for facility planning. So this will go out and you should, this will be out in households in the next day or two in terms of what that looks like. And then, <coughs> yep. so on January 22nd, we have an all district uh, in service, all employees, not just teachers. And so Bray Architects will be coming. If you remember, I shared with the board um, back when Corals and Bray had <coughs> shared with us the um, campaigning do's and don'ts. And so we thought it would be helpful when all of our employees are gathered together to talk to them about what they can and can't do in terms of if they are a resident and a staff member using district <coughs> resources and time and effort. They can't do that, but they're more outside of school time. They are more than ha they can campaign either way that they, they want. So we're going to use that time. Bray's going to come on January 22nd to talk to all of our district staff about what they can and can't do in terms of campaigning. Because they might get questions, you know, by parents, no matter where they might see them, what can they say, what can they not say. So we just want to be very clear that they understand what they can and can't do, and we thought it was the most efficient way of doing it since all of our staff would be gathered across the board, all employees. So those are some events that are coming up, starting with the Whitna Window coming out in the next couple days, next Monday, having um, a meeting in here for anybody who wants <coughs> to give us some input. And then the following Monday is talking to all of our staff. And so on the board meeting on the 22nd that night, you'll see hopefully a more comprehensive plan and what it looks like between now and April 3rd um, as we gather some of these input parts. But wanted to let you know what the communication has been going on since the board passed a resolution um, in December to lead us up to this point. And as I note on the 22nd, <coughs> that meeting will also finish the scope of the project and make that final, it'll be a straw vote, but we'll finalize the project there. So as Lisa mentioned, when they start taking video, start uploading it, it's all accurate. They're not recording stuff and then we decide in February that we're changing. As to what we're exactly doing? Yeah, well, with that last decision we needed to make, that's it. And it'll just be a straw vote, it won't be an action item, it'll just be <coughs> So if you have any other follow-up questions or anything you want to clarify before that night, reach out to Mike or Lisa or Todd or whoever. Um, we can get that done. Feel free to join us next Monday. I mean, you're not obligated to. It's an open meeting for anybody, but we'll come back to what we gather from that. Um, from folks who, who, who have some really good ideas and we want to make sure that we use them in terms of helping us plan for that. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, so B is 2018 WASB resolutions. So Me? in, yep. You I was looking to you, you usually have one or two that you... No. No? No, I, I did go through them and uh, the biggest part is, you know, you have to go there with an open mind because the discussion on the floor <coughs> can change your mind. Uh, and we give you the, the power to vote, so just have an open mind. Any, Lisa, did you have any? No, I just, that they're in there, we wanted to make sure the board was aware of what WASB has brought forward. As you're aware, any district can bring forward any resolution on the floor that did not get um, forwarded from the committee. <coughs> Kevin is our representative at the convention, and so he'll voting on that. So I just wanted to give people, if they hadn't had a chance to see what the resolutions are that they would be voting on, um, just an opportunity to voice that or, or at least give some feedback on their um, insurance and that. So, yep. 
Okay, great. Any other questions? Kevin, thank you for agreeing to do that. Um, item five is discussion of future action, and that's open enrollment. So, Mike? Yep, so this will break out into two motions or two action items <coughs> on the 22nd. One will be what to do uh, with tuition waiver students, those who move out of our district during the year and thus still get a waiver to attend. And then uh, traditionally, they would have to apply for open enrollment for the very next year. So, as we always um, have done, the tuition waiver students are automatically allowed to open the room next year. And so I think um, now might be the appropriate time to discuss that based on a couple of factors. I'll get to that in a second. And then, so that'll be the first action. And then the second <coughs> action will be that how many new open room seats as we've done every January. So what I've provided you is uh, a couple different pieces of, of information. But this kind of goes along with uh, the report from the last time as well, if you can recall. I want to take a look at that piece of information as well. But as we look at our, our student counts and kind of what has been happening in the last three years, we've seen that we've, we've kept our open enrollment pretty stable between that 415 and 425 open enrollment students in, something around in the 90s as far as an open enrollment out. And so while those numbers have remained stable, we've seen our overall head count start to rise, which means our residency appears to be um, picking up, and there was a huge increase this past year of 50 um, resident members, how, that, how that's broken down into membership. And so that kind of begs the question that is, as, as, as if residency is indeed <coughs> rising, and if that is the trend, and it's anecdotal right now, we, we don't have a real uh, 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 data story on that. So it's anecdotal, but if, if we see that it is, is rising, um, is it prudent to continue to automatically allow tuition waiver students to open enroll the next year if we are concerned that that, that headcount is going to start to, to rise and residency is picking up? So what, what we can do is a couple different things uh, as far as tuition waiver students go. If we wouldn't automatically allow tuition waiver students to, to be at Whitman the next year, they would get preferential treatment on the on the uh, open enrollment list. So whatever seats that we have open at each of the grade levels, tuition waiver students would be at the top of that list as far as getting in um, to the open enrollment process. Um, this would allow us a couple different things. It would, those, those students who, where the grades are, are there, the grade seats are there, allow them in, no big deal. However, for families who have moved out of the district and they're not automatically enrolled in or open enrolled in and there aren't those seats yet, it allows us to kind of wait a little further into the process, into how many students are moving into the district, how many new students are showing up, that we can make a decision maybe a little later in the process. So from a district standpoint, it gives us the flexibility. Obviously, from a parent standpoint, they have to wait longer now to know, is my child going to be going to Whitman, or do I have to en enroll somewhere else and, and get my name on some other lists? or simply be in the home district that, that I've moved to. Um, so that's kind of the trade-off as far as um, allowing this. As residency, if residency is indeed picking up, it might be nice to have that flexibility, but we want to you know, treat um, families in, a, in a, a timely way as far as letting them know whether they're, they're going to be here or not. So in, in that regard, um, there's, I, I think that, that it's a time to just discuss that again about what we want to do with that action item. The data then that the three different scenarios is simply looking at in the scenario one, if we accepted all the current 32 tuition waiver students, um, how many then seats would be available knowing that those 32 were already in there. Um, and so we would have 37 new seats available um, based on the optimal capacity that you see in those spreadsheets. And we can certainly talk about the optimal capacity if you would like. Uh, the next two scenarios are two different ways in which if we don't automatically accept tuition waiver students, I pull them either out of the projection or I pull them out of the final, um, uh, out of the final projection and pull them out of the total. <coughs> There's just two different ways in which to, to, to ensure um, how many seats, uh, <coughs> the scenario in which we could open up seats. They, they yielded very similar results, 50 seats versus 47 seats. So it's kind of a matter of how many new seats do we want to open, knowing that tuition waiver students are not automatically going to be um, brought in. And so, to 
kind of define how our conversation goes with tuition waiver students. That can kind of be done. Which, which, which scenario do we choose as far as how many open enrollment um, new seats do we want? Um, I hope that was clear. Um, so I, I guess what I'd like to get direction on is first and foremost <coughs> whether um, it is worth talking about whether we automatically accept tuition waiver students or if they should be placed on a preferential list and they'll still have to go through the open enrollment process. Is there anything you want to add? Candy can add anything as well. She's intimately involved in that thing process. The only that flexibility that is nice about maybe not <coughs> automatically accepting those tuition waiver students is that right now we know of 32 of them. But after you make this decision between now and the end of the school year, a lot of times we get a whole lot more students that pop up that we weren't aware of. So <coughs> by giving yourself more flexibility, more control over So that's the catch, because we have to declare with DPI now the, what our January open enrollment seats right. are, yeah. right? We have to report to DPI by January 30th the number of open enrollment seats by law. <coughs> Every district has to do that. And yeah. we do have that flexibility after the deadline, so when we get into the end of June and into July, we have a, a chance to better look at our projected enrollment versus the true enrollment <coughs> and know if we maybe have more room than we thought we did. You know, it gives us a little bit more control. So how did our class sizes fair with the uh, un <coughs> when we didn't know we were getting these abnormally high number of students yeah. and we already accepted the uh, open enrollments and we already accepted the, t <coughs> the uh, tuition waivers. So a few <coughs> different things that you can think about in that case. So on, on those spreadsheets where, I, where we look at optimal capacity and mm -hmm. we get to look at each grade whether to open those negatives those negative outcomes, are, those negative numbers are considered over capacity, right? And so maybe in those instances, maybe there should have been as many, um, or, or anywhere along the line as far as how many students we were bringing in at some point, we might have well beyond optimal capacity. Um, there's a second point that I lost it. What was your question, Cliff? How have we fared? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. That was a question. Yep. So the, the other, thank you. So then the other point then is, especially at the 4K <coughs> level, uh, we get, we, we, we really have to guess. I mean, there, there's a more guessing game at the 4K level than anywhere else. And so what we're finding, I look to Chris, uh, what we're finding is at the 4K level, you have Edgerton residents, for example, who are coming into the process, maybe enrolling their child in, in February or March, and um, <coughs> we've taken some open enrollment in based on a guess of what we think the 4K is going to be, and all of a sudden Edgerton's at capacity, and now we're taking a look and going, okay, well, there's Edgerton residents going in, we're at capacity at the 4K level, you're going to be at HCE. So, I mean, there's, there's <coughs> just, and, and then for kindergarten, we're back to Edgerton because now that capacity is back to where it needs to be. So that's, that's an example of the 4K level. So we've kind of tried to to bring that 4K level down a little bit. But we also like to have stu students <coughs> open enroll in. If, if you're going to get an open enrollment student in, having at the 4K level is, is really good and that they're in our district from the beginning and you can move them all the way through. Um, so I mean, with, with everything, Clint, there's, there's just a lot of considerations to look at. But the residency is really where we start to go, whoa, what, is this, are we swinging back? Is it a residency swinging back? And where, where is that coming from? Lisa, you might know better. There are two things that I'd want to point out. 4K and ninth grade are critical pieces that we have no control over. So right now we offer two <coughs> sections of 4K at Edgerton, and we offer three sections of 5K. So we're one less section at Edgerton than what they will see in 5K. Hales Corners, because we run, we run four sections of 4K, and that's they are a four-section elementary. So that right there, because of the disparity between it. So we're running six sections of 4K when all of our other grades are seven sections, if that makes sense. So the challenge of that is, is that we're not running as many for a couple reasons. <coughs> there are some parents who still, very few, but a few who don't send their child to 4K at all. However, what the trend tends to be is we have parents who send their child to a different district for 4K because we don't offer full day 4K. That is becoming, so I know two of our contingent districts I'm working with are going to offering full day 4K. So we will find some parents who have all of their kids here but always will open and roll at 4K because they want a full day 4K program. 
So because of that, they don't come here 4K, and then they are resident students. Then they come to us as they are allowed to in 5K. Um, so that becomes a challenge for us in trying to predict how many we can take in 4K, because once they're with us in 4K, they're going to stay with us. And so the discrepancy between the sections that we run in the two elementaries, the situation Mike talked about was pretty real this year. I had some families contact me who, let's say they have three kids in elementary school. Their 4 k -er is having to go to HCE, but their other two elementary kids are at Edgerton, knowing that their 4 k -er will actually go back to Edgerton because that's where their resident is, but we don't have enough sections at Edgerton to match the number of kids. So that becomes an issue when we're talking <coughs> about our littlest learners not getting used to a building that, that will become theirs for the next six years. So there, you know, there's things with that I just wanted to be aware of. <coughs> the other part that happens at ninth grade is that is where we tend to pick up our most students who have been attending a K-8 private school who are our resident students. And we can't control that because they are our residents. And we don't really know until we, they get to that point if they're coming here. So both at the 4K and ninth grade, we have things where we could have resident students who haven't been with us but have the ability to come to us, in addition to just the 50 students that move <coughs> in that grew in our population to come. So the variables that make it challenging for us to sort of mitigate that, we have a really high population. I think it's at third grade, which happened last year when we have an influx at second grade. Those numbers are much higher than we would like to see. Um, and so we'll try to control that. But I mean, you know that open enrollment is used to try to mitigate that. But when you have these other <coughs> factors that we, we can't deny resident students, and the 4K and ninth grade thing always come into play. Um, and you know, it, it's very challenging <coughs> to take an open enrollment student as a junior or senior in high school um, if they haven't moved into our district because they might often be you know, in a situation where, where they've been, um, we, we haven't had them for a long time. And so it, it, so th those are the questions that we always talk about wanting to do what's in the best interest of, of the, and trying to watch those numbers, um, especially in our elementary <coughs> school or space issue. So are we using open enrollment to fill up those classes? That's still our strategy, but some of these other variables are giving us l less control over that because all of a sudden we can't control how many students move in or we can't control some of those other features. So we're to the best of our ability we are, but tuition waiver seems to be the biggest variable, all of a sudden, factor that's played into that. We've had a, that is becoming a growing number of families who move, like between now, as Kathy said, between <coughs> now and when school starts, out of our district, and because we automatically give them open enrollment, those are above and beyond the open enrollment seats that you approved tonight. So let's say 50 more kids move out, their families move to New Berlin, and they, they automatically get to come here, which are 50 kids through that process that we didn't count on. And so the current tuition waiver children would be grandfathered in? <coughs> Not be grandfathered in. No, that, that's what they well, once they're open enrollment now, they were once tuition waiver, they became open enrollment, so they're here for good. They don't, <coughs> it's only new current right. tuition waiver. Yes. 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 Now I think it's pretty simple that we need to give the administration as much flexibility as possible, in my opinion. Okay, see. So I just have a question. <coughs> so let's say that there's a family and they have a fifth <coughs> grader, a third grader, and a three-year-old, and they move out of the district. So is the three-year-old also <coughs> included in the tuition waiver? Or would, if we, if we allowed the third and fifth grader in as tuition waiver students, There's then the does the three-year-old still have to go through open enrollment? They do. They're, they're placed. There's a preference, though, that they rise to the top because of siblings. Okay. So if we had zero spots open in 4K, <coughs> they would, there wouldn't be. But if we did have some spots, kids that have siblings here, they would get a preference and would go to the top of that open. So you're only tuition waiver for one year, then you become an open enrollment, then you're, okay. you're in <coughs> at you're that in point. So time. yeah, the tuition waiver is a real short amount of time, but once that third and fifth grader became open enrollment students, their sibling would still have to do open enrollment, but they would get preference on the top of those spots that open up. So, <laughs> so to give you some insight into that process, so Kathy and I will do the lottery in, in February, whatever it is. Obviously, we're looking and we're recognizing these siblings are rise to the top. If there are <coughs> not, if there's, a, if there's no seats available, we're obviously on our radar to say, hey, if we can, <coughs> the earliest that we can know that this grade level can accept another child or two, or whatever the number is, we're, we're cognizant that, that, that okay. those siblings are sitting on that list. And it's only fair to parents that we get to them as quickly as possible. Um, but if there's a resident influx and those <coughs> grade levels rise and they're beyond optimal capacity, then we cut it 
off. Right. But even as late as mid-August, we're going, okay, there, there's, <coughs> some, there's some room here, and then we, we go to the list and see who's there and reach out to families. Okay. So do you have a <coughs> preference either way between keeping it as it is or changing it so that we don't automatically accept? Yeah, I agree with Quinn. One of the other parts, as you know, you saw, you heard, if you were a parent, you heard my voicemail that came out urgently <coughs> a couple days before school this year, is that we still had a big chunk of our kids, our resident students who weren't registered. That made it very <coughs> challenging for us to know how many spots we actually had, because we're trying to fill the needs of anybody who wants to come to our mm -hmm. district. And we did, so we're going to really change with our online registration that we started last year. We're going to change, we're going to move that up um, into July so we can make sure that we're having as many, and then follow up with those resident <coughs> students that we believe to be continuing who have not yet registered because then we actually have a more accurate count. Because if we assume if it's the day before school and a family hasn't registered, you would assume they're not attending here and they moved and they haven't told you. They show up on the first day of school and that <coughs> happens to 60 families and now we've called some on a waiting list. That really puts us in a bind too. But families are waiting to know where their child is going to go sure. to school on the first, so we want to be as responsive. So we're going to move the timeline up to resident registration so we have a lot better accurate count of how many families are there's, there's a delay when families don't always think about notifying the school district <coughs> when they move. So we have to be pretty diligent on that in terms of reminding them that it's, you know, and, and so, yeah. So if you have a student that moves out of the district in February, you're automatically on tuition <coughs> waiver for August. For the yeah, if they're on tuition waiver currently. For that right. rest of that school year. They right. have to open the room come the fall. But so we're automatically letting them do the open enrollment <coughs> in the fall. That has been the practice. Right. So my question is, is there a point at which they have to declare whether or not they do want to be here? We're, we're saying you're going to, I'm assuming we notify them that they're automatically enrolled. So is there a point at which the family can choose to accept that? They still have to fill out the open enrollment paperwork. Right. But there's still a point at which they have to Correct. accept that Correct. automatic seat for them. Correct? Yes. Okay. So there's a point that they could refuse, right? So here's my concern. For me, the philosophy for tuition waivers and automatically open enrollment for the following year was continuity of education and continuity of family. So if there's a reason <coughs> that they've moved out and not having the children come back to Whitnall is disruptive to the children, <coughs> I don't think it helps us not to offer the automatic enrollment. I think in some cases, I wouldn't presume to know every family situation, but it might do more harm than good to have them forced into a choice <coughs> because they didn't automatically know where their kid was going. And I, in the spirit of, of what I always believe tuition waivers to be, I don't want to see that automatic enrollment go <coughs> away. While it's true, we'd rather get the families in at 4K or at kindergarten to ensure that the families stay with us, you know, assuming that that's, that's the scenario for the reason that they're coming in. <coughs> yeah, I could see where it would make sense to, to try to attract the longer term and the one that, that you know is for now. But I would <coughs> rather that we service the families and the children <coughs> first with continuity of education before we think about give them that, that level of comfort, especially where they can make the choice based <coughs> on their family situation whether or not they're going to accept an automatic enrollment. And I'd rather leave the choice up to the family. I think the challenge for all of us is right now we're talking about hypothetical situations. Unfortunately, the situation you talk about is the rare case. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't give certain, obviously, the, the information surrounding it. And that's where I think you're seeing the why this is coming forward because that's not the case that we're seeing. <coughs> um, and as you know, there's an <coughs> affidavit process, uh, process also that turns into then tuition waiver pieces also. So I think that that whole process that we're trying to look at right now, and I think that we've been pretty responsive when that, I don't think we've ever rejected a situation where the continuity is the case. And so it's, the problem is that we're s every individual case has a unique story with it. Um, it's just creating sort of a, you know, a bottleneck here because the situation
situation has happened is if we automatically continue that and then we have resident students now, do we hire another teacher? Do, you know, what, what, what would be that answer if, we, if we've created a situation where we're sitting with 32 second graders in their classes? That, I guess that's, I want the board to be aware if, if that's what that is. And, and then we were really close to that last year with our second graders. We lost a few over, I don't want to say luckily, but we were at the point that we almost needed to decide what are we going to do with that. Um, so I guess that's the reality, is if we automatically roll it over for that, because we're doing the best we can planning, but we can't control the resident students that come in, even with no open enrollment seats, we could end up with, <coughs> and I don't think, you know, looking at our optimal situation, none of us are trying to put 32, you know, younger children in any classroom at any point, so. And we can't change the timeline, because that's we, Those are state statutes, yeah, and those are the notifications <coughs> when they have to let us know when the, and that, that perpetual open enrollment app, as soon as the regular window closes in April, then the best interest of the child perpetual open enrollment <coughs> applications start also. Yeah. Anything else? I'd rather do this. I'd rather we continue to automatically enroll. Okay. <coughs> I mean, I mean there's, there's, uh, there's, there's things to both sides. Uh, or obviously, I would just come, we would just come up with, uh, with a scenario that's why we love to follow that um, everyone has to at least talk about the financial piece. As long as it's attached dollars, the thing. <coughs> uh, the state obviously continues to, not obviously, the state continues to increase the dollar amount for open enrollment in and out. So <coughs> each year of the biennium, the dollar amount for in and out students is going up $300. It's a significant amount of dollars to go, to go up. And if your district, if you, win, if you gain 10 and you lose 10, it's a wash. It doesn't matter how you could go up a million dollars. It doesn't matter. A million dollars, 10 million is going out, 10 million is coming in. It's a wash. If your district, though, that inc can increase that gap, right, your in becomes greater than your out in a given year, financially, you <coughs> continue to come out ahead as well. And so the scenario in which we do carry over tuition waiver students automatically it is now an increase of the 37 kids, because that's what the math says, is we would have to open up 37 seats, plus the 32, 69 open enrollment students in, and you know, that's, that's a fairly large, large number in, in a, in a given year, and we don't see that many going out, so we'll probably see our gap continue to, to widen, which has a financial impact. <coughs> At the same time, though, if you don't, if you don't bring those tuition waiver students in, you're banking on them because well, it's more residents coming into the district because that's why we'd be limiting it. Obviously, residents, we know from our revenue room formula, carry a greater dollar amount than open enrollment in and outs. And so there may just be that simple trade off that, yes, you're not getting that same, you might be losing some open enrollment in students, and that gap might be shrinking, causing more dollars to go out that way, but you might just simply be recovering in your revenue room formula. So there, there's, there's a lot of those considerations to take, and so we can see both sides of it. And, um, I guess from a, from a proposal standpoint, <coughs> um, and, and obviously we don't have a full board here t uh, tonight uh, also, um, I, I can come forward with just a proposal that says one way or the other, and, and we just vote on it from there, I and mean, it's that kind of... And well, I, don't to, I don't want to take a straw poll right, right now on the yeah. Here, let's see. Well, Can I have one other question. Is there any way to add qualifiers on the tuition waivers, or is it just that's it? The I ask because I'm curious to know if we run into where someone moves in the district, get, gets an apartment for a month, gets their kid on there, tuition waiver, and you're in now. And yeah, you, you, you worry there. about that game, right? That, that, or, or I, and, and I don't know what the perception is out there. I don't know if the perception <laughs> is if, if, if we just leave the district, I know that I'm going to get in, and so I don't need to stay in Whitnall. I, I can be <coughs> wherever I want, and I know that I'll come back, and I'll, I'll be able to stay at Whitnall. Um, it, I'm just curious, because I know it's happened in some other schools where they'll do that. You know, parents know they want, maybe they live somewhere not as desirable as mm -hmm. maybe we live, in their opinion, they'll rent an apartment so they can establish a residency so that they can get in, and then that's it, and you're, you're good to go. So it's really all or nothing is what it is? When it comes to tuition waivers, it's a, it's a state form. Yeah. And so the parents fill out the form, and there's, depending <coughs> upon the date of their move, will depend upon the section of the form that they fill out. And they have, there are certain qualifiers, qualifiers that they have to be. Like um, the first section might be that they had to have been in attendance for our first count day in September and 20 school days. And then if they meet the criteria <coughs> under those sections, Okay. Now, 
then the state requires you to give them not only a current year waiver for the remainder of this year, but we would also have to grant them an additional year waiver for all of next year. So it allows families flexibility to, you know, oh my gosh, we have to do an arch. It still allows them to have that continuity of education throughout the next school year and then apply for open enrollment. I guess, is there any way for us to personally add our own thing where it qualifies and you can't establish, I mean, you haven't established residency of X amount of years, we'll give you the, which there was, I guess, more or less my point. Yeah, no. Okay. That was my only question. Do you have a preference either way? I'm not strong either way. I completely understand where Stephanie comes from on that. You get a family that divorces and the parents move somewhere else, and you run into a situation of you've got how many children switching schools. For right now, I don't have a preference either way, but like I said, I guess, like you said, I would be okay with bringing the proposal this way or that way, however it's going to go. Right down the middle. Huh? Right down the middle. Got it. So I understand where Stephanie's coming from, and I appreciate that. I would lean more towards not automatically renewing it. I think it gives the district a little more control and flexibility to adjust as we need to to make sure that we aren't in a situation where we're over in one class or not in another, because then it comes back to the conversation of class size, and then we're back to that. So if we can give them more flexibility to stop that and control the numbers, I think it will benefit us down the road because we can better prepare and try to manage class size. So take with it what you will. When you've got the feedback here, and then we'll go from there. Got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. So next item number is Six, uh, the interview of the Board of Education candidates, discuss and take action to fill the Board of Education vacancy. Um, so just for the audience, uh, a couple, and TV2, a couple notes regarding it. Um, each candidate <coughs> will have five minutes to speak. Uh, the presentation and ballot order were decided via random selection last week, Friday. Uh, the order is um, Karen, then Jesse, and then Stephen. Um, Voting will be done using pre-printed ballots, which Kathy already has. We'll hold a maximum of 10 votes. Uh, candidate must receive a majority of votes. Um, in this case, based on the number, it would be three um, to win the election. Uh, if a candidate <coughs> is not selected during the first vote, candidate with the lowest number of votes will be eliminated before the next vote. Uh, the name of the eliminated candidate will be crossed off the ballot prior to the next vote. Uh, if we do not reach a minimum of three votes for a candidate after the 10th vote, a motion to table the vote until the meeting on January 22nd will need to be made and voted on or poor board policy. The board president will appoint the new board member after the 60-day window <coughs> ends. Um, questions will not be allowed during the candidate presentations. And um, we will swear in the new board member immediately following the vote. And then they will join us up here for the rest of the meeting. So any questions from board members before we start? Yes. One clarification. The motion to table has to come before the 10th? Come after. Can come after. <coughs> we just have, yeah, can come after the 10th. Correct, and I tally the votes. And Correct. And then I announce who got how many votes. We exactly. You don't have to, um, so the, the who voted for who, but. You exactly, know. yeah, the secret ballots aren't allowed, so each board member will have to sign the ballot after they make their selection. And pass it over to Kevin. Kevin will tally. Thank you. Got it. You're welcome. Got it. I do. Okay. So with that, if we don't have any other questions, um, Karen, do you want to start? So you can have a seat right here and. So hi everyone, my name is Karen Michalinas. Um, I'm pleased to be here tonight. Thanks for having me. Um, did you all receive a copy of the letter of intent and candidate questionnaire? I put a lot um, into those answers, so hopefully that gives you kind of an overview of who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, to summarize, 
I am a Whitnall parent. I have two kids at Whitnall Middle School and a son in the third grade, that large third grade class at Edgerton Elementary School. Um, I've been a resident of the district for almost 20 years, so a long time. Um, and I pay taxes here. <laughs> so um, I have the experience both as a parent at the school and as someone who uh, pays property taxes every January. Um, when I was thinking about why, um, why I'd like to be on the school board, first of all, I take an interest in the schools, of course, because my children are here, um, also as a community member. And I think we have great schools. Um, at Edgerton, we've had a wonderful experience. I think things are going well for the kids. At the same time, I feel that there's always opportunities to improve. There's always opportunities to be involved. And serving on school board is a <coughs> valuable opportunity to make a difference in the community. Um, when I was reading about school boards, I went online and I read several things. I watched a couple of videos of your meetings. So that was um, good, good background information. But the most meaningful thing to me was that being on a school board, a school board can make a difference in educational outcomes. And that meant something to me and encouraged me to feel that's why I should be here. Um, not just for my own children, but for all of the children. Um, I know what you're working on is long term, and you're going to <coughs> year 2020, I think, is your plan. I'm interested in knowing more about your long-term plans and vision and the, the work that's been done so far. But um, I feel that my involvement does have a chance to make a difference, and that's why I'm the most interested. That's, that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, let's see, what else? I have a background. Um, right now, I work as a fitness instructor in the community. I work <coughs> as a financial writer, um, which is really fun and interesting because I get to review companies and learn all about them and really dig in and research topics. And I feel that that's something that I could do um, with the school board topics too. I'm nerdy. I like reading things. I like, I went on and looked at the statutes and looked at the laws and kind of dug into it a little <coughs> bit. You can only go so far. Um, I did not get through the entire school policy manual. I started. <laughs> but seeing how you work, I think it's something that you bring things here, we can work on things. I reviewed the packet for tonight before I came. So I feel that I could come to meetings prepared and ready. You don't need to read the slides <coughs> to me. I kind of catch on quick and know what's going on. Um, another thing that I was thinking of as I was planning on coming here was reflecting on my own public school education. I grew up in West De Pere, Wisconsin, and until I was preparing to come here, I didn't really think a lot about my public school education, you know? I went to school, <laughs> I graduated, I went to college, I got on with life. But um, thinking about coming here tonight, I thought about my own education, and I feel I got a very high quality education, particularly at West Pier High School. Um, the district there is somewhat similar to Whitnall. Um, we're not, well, it's a suburban district located next to a larger city of Green Bay. It has a high school, a junior high school, and two elementary schools. Um, I was a good student. I participated in things like um, a honors English class where you receive college credit. So I'm familiar with some of those things that are going on in the district here. Um, it had very good extracurricular activities, um, good sports, you know, just a nice <coughs> range of things. My graduating class was about 180 kids, so a, a, a similar, you know, similar in size to what we have at Whitnall. And if my kids got the same kind of education that I received, particularly in high school, <coughs> I would feel extremely satisfied with that kind of outcome. So that's a little bit of you know, that's a long time ago, <laughs> but that's also sort of my frame of reference for what I seek out of a public education. Um, not, not just for my kids, but for the kids who are in this district. And that hits us at five minutes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs>
Okay. Uh, Jesse, you're next. Good evening. I'm Jesse Stahoviak. Thank you very much for taking the time today to listen to my pitch. Um, I am a alumni of this school district. I've lived in this district uh, 10 years. Moved out, bought a house, and decided to move back, uh, actually at the tail end of building a house. So I've really invested in this district. I've attended several board meetings. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen me here. I've worked to try and petition the board to change certain policies that were outdated or needed updating. Um, that one uh, that I spoke of was actually early admittance policy and I was pretty happy with the result on that. Uh, I was a couple years old and I was happy with the overall result for 421 and 421R. I've attended uh, several fundraising events for the schools. Um, I have two children in the district. One is in K-4, one is in K-5. So I will be here for a very long time, 13 years. So that just shows my commitment to wanting to be here and wanting to be involved. I also um, do some volunteering. I headed up the United Way campaign for uh, my department at work, this IT department. I've also helped deliver and transport food to the guest house in Milwaukee. And I've also volunteered through work for distributing cookie books. Uh, I work for We Energies, so if you've ever seen those books, they're a pretty popular item. And I've worked at the um, Energy Park, if you've ever seen that at State Fair, working with the kids and putting on the find me wristbands, what to do. I've learned a lot from attending the school board meetings. Um, I've seen a wide variety of things that you've done, setting calendars, um, voting on different things that are important to policy, uh, just a wide variety of those options. Um, some of my governmental experience, um, I currently work for We Energies in IT, and what I currently do is um, compliance related, so critical infrastructure protection and adhering to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It's a lot of governmental rules, making sure that we're abiding by those things. So I'm very familiar with government policies and how things are written. I believe that the children are the primary focus of, of what the school board is. I understand that the taxpayers are important, but the children come first in my opinion. And that's one of the main reasons, um, not only for my own children, but for all of them in the district. Um, having been an alumni, I've seen how much this benefits all the kids. I came from a parochial school, um, from kindergarten through eighth grade. So I came here for high school. And it was a little tough for me because the standard was so high for this district, which was really great because I adjusted and I came out a lot better than I came in. And that was a choice that my parents made to take me out of a parochial system and put me into a public system because they believed in this school district. And I believe I'm a pretty good product of that. Um, my brother and sister have also been in the system even longer than I had, and they did even better than I did. So it's a really a good testament to what this school is all about. Um, one thing I find impressive about it, too, is the honors program and being able to give those kids the opportunity to earn college credits before they're even in college is just spectacular. And that leaves more room open for them to explore what they really want to do. And I think that's another great thing about this district is the personalized learning and where you kind of tailor it to each individual kid. And I think that's great. That's something I didn't personally have. And I know that some kids are stronger in some areas and not so strong in others. And I think that's great that you can kind of shift it a little bit and make the perception different about learning. Um, another thing, my experience in information technology, I think would be a great asset to the board when it comes to making technology purchase decisions. If the school is looking to implement new software for learning, uh, I know that there was a specific piece of software for, um, I think it was biology or science in one of the previous meetings where that was really, really neat how 
You're not investing in textbooks that are going to get old. The curriculum constantly changes. You're able to customize it more. You're not just, here it is, this is what you do. You've got about five seconds. Okay. And my attitude towards board teamwork is I'm willing to work with anybody. I appreciate opinions, and I really hope that I'm the candidate of your choice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Steven? Thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. Apologize for my get up. It's a really important game tonight. I'm a Georgia alumni. I'm really excited, but I'm here instead. So just to quit, I presume you have all my paperwork, but one of the things I just wanted to touch on with my resume and everything is I come from a family of educators. My sister is about hours away from getting her PhD in education. My mother was a special education educator. My uncle is a PhD in education at Kent State. And my job currently is working at the medical college and teaching residents and fellows adult learning. Um, as far as my role or my involvement in the school so far, you know, the biggest thing that I do at this time is I'm president of the Band Boosters, which means I'm helping out a lot and supporting the music program. You know, whether it's <clears throat> providing things for concerts in between, organizing the uh, marching band camps and transporting the kids and transporting the instruments, things like that, working with the uh, um, music director uh, to see what his needs are and trying to support those. I was also fortunate to be involved in choosing the new athletic director in my role as the band booster president. I've also been involved with the Falcon boosters, mostly with concessions, working many football games. My wife is one of the concession leads, which kind of by marriage means I am too. So I'm orienting people and bringing in new parents all the time for that kind of thing. Um, I also helped out with the WSMA music program that we had this last year. Basically, Mr. Nowak did the music part of it, and the band boosters did all the rest of it, setting up all the food and getting everything oriented or organized that way. And then one of the things that lately that my wife and I have both been doing is attending the uh, Parent Learning Academies for the Honors Program and trying to see what's going on with that. We currently have one daughter. She's a junior this year. Um, we've been in the district our whole lives. Um, you know, we moved here as part of this was the beginning of our adult lives, so we've been in the district ever since then and brought our daughter here. This was one of the school district was one of the reasons why we moved here. Um, the appeal I have for applying to the school board is kind of twofold. One is I like the direction that the board is taking right now. I've been very enthused and empowered by the new leadership that we have, that the personalized learning is taking by tackling the referendum issue again. You know, with my daughter in club volleyball, we see lots of high schools across the state and Ours doesn't compare physically too well to them. However, in like the band competitions and other things, I think our students can outcompete anybody in the state. I'm very proud to be from Whitnall. Um, the other part of the board thing is I actually serve on four different boards at this time. So I'm very used to you know, <coughs> working with people, doing committee things, kind of trying to stay on purpose to what the board's <coughs> goals are. I look through your policies to kind of see what um, you know, what you use, what is your purpose for being here, how you try and accomplish that. You know, I've been on, um, most of what I do is with the hospital and with our practice board, but I'm also on a, um, a national surveying, accrediting healthcare committee board, and that's like <coughs> business, and we're up there making all our business decisions. Um, a couple of the boards I've been involved in have gone through a couple of upheavals, so I'm kind of used to tackling big issues and working through things that way. Um, you know, the last thing that I wanted to do is political things aside, I always get really mad when you're having to pick between a couple candidates and it's the lesser of two evils. So I'm hoping to at least be the person who's not evil, that at least you would consider filling a position as someone who wants to work here, someone who believes in the program, and someone who's willing to bring the experience I have doing similar work and hopefully providing and lifting up the board as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, Kathy, Kathy will pass out the ballots again. Select your candidate, sign the bottom, and we'll pass them down to Kevin. And we'll you just kind of place them somewhere. somewhere. In the Three great candidates, really. Thank you, yeah. and yeah. you're all very impressive. Really, it's unbelievable. I don't know why you didn't run for my job. <laughs>
additional here? Not Just say the total for. All right, so. Well, we do have a winner, so that's good. So we only did that ten vote business, so that's nice. <laughs> so with the winner, uh, four votes is Stephen Butts. So boots, boots, four, four to one, and then the other person receiving the vote was uh, Jesse as well. So four to one. So you uh, got my whatever I have to say. I don't have again. that. So Jesse and Kieran, thank you both thank for you. your time and, and putting your information. Yeah. We really appreciate it. I think she's going to get it. I don't remember. So actually, while she's going to get it, why don't we... Uh, I'd shake your hands, but I'm a little not well. I understand. I mean, I know you're probably around some sick people sometimes, <laughs> but you know... Oh, you're going to do that? I'm just going to sit out in the aisle. This is a This is an odd shape. Okay. Uh, you keep laughing. Put him over there. <laughs> well, it's, uh, like it's, We're only going to be here for like 10 more seconds. I you know, sit over not? there. Why not? I did that. Yeah. Yeah. She did, he did yeah. that to make him feel. Oh, hard. I thought that was from the swearing in it hurt. No. no well, we got to wait for. I think yeah. Kathy's getting it. She's, she's, getting, she's it. getting the stuff. Okay. And then all we're really, really going to do is adjourn to closed session. So you'll be there by yourself for. <laughs> However long it takes for Kathy to get back over it. Um, so just as a note, so with this, um, an email account will be created. Chris will start on that this week. We'll have that to you later this week. Chris Comp. Um, uh, yeah, so he'll have that set up. There'll also be a Chromebook or an I Chromebook. So it'll be a Chromebook for you to use. It'll have all the district stuff set up on it, so you can do that. Um, and you'll be on the email groups and everything starting as soon as emails all over right. So should should we just at this point adjourn to go session and do the swearing in after? Can he sit in in the meeting? Okay, then we'll wait. Five minutes ago. <laughs> so I really hope this. But who's counting? Yeah, I, only, I, I'm not distracted. We can only at all. hope the, the closed session goes a few hours long. Yeah, I do have Whitnell closed too, so just so you know. It's already 14 up. <laughs> <clears throat> no, he's just giving. Roll tide. <laughs> I wore my gamma shirt last year. You did. Did you? Oh, you did. I hope you're wearing it again this year, then. Well, Darn. Sure. Paul Feinbaum seems to think that Alabama's going to go all the way because Steve Sable won't lose. Nick Sable won't lose two years in a row. So. But he tends to be wrong on that. So it's OP. Paul Feinbaum's voice? What sound? No, it's the sound. You won't allow it. <laughs> and so Kevin, as the clerk, needs to read it, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then, if you want to go in front, do you want to? I have to take a picture of Chris. You do. I haven't done a tweet today, so of course. You need to be in this picture. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Well, if you not want. forward to the camera so you just yeah. get his picture. You've been on it the whole time. Yeah.
Here, just go stand right there. Just go stand right there. Hey, Steve, just stand right there. It's fine. Just stand right there. Don't worry about it. Okay, um, so with that, item 7 is motion to adjourn a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851C to discuss A, staff resignation, B, administrator contracts, and C, superintendent mid-year evaluation. So Nancy? Moved. Second. All in favor? No. Aye. 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 Nancy? Aye. Stephanie? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Quinn? Aye. Jonathan? Aye. Steve? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks, Steve or Steven?